Thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Remy Trudell. I'm Associate Professor of Marketing here at Quest from School of Business. Uh, I've been here about 10, 11 years and I teach core marketing to MBAs. Um, as most of you know, um, marketing is not simply just an important part of kind of business success. It really is the business. Uh, everything else in business depends on marketing and Mark Cuban is one of my favorites and the reason he's one of my favorites because he said that this one you know, kind of really profound statement. And he said, uh, no marketing, no company. Um, so today we're fortunate to have an expert in marketing, especially when it comes to marketing and distribution of consumer packaged goods. Uh, consumer packaged goods accounted for 720 billion in sales last year. Um, and our core marketing class for MBAs, one third of those cases that we look at are consumer packaged good cases. Um, as a backdrop, most manufacturers and producers of consumer packaged goods um, don't sell directly to the end consumers and they need to use some kind of channel distribution. Uh, the problem is, is many lack the financial resources and expertise to manage these, these channels and to sell to channel members on their own. So in core marketing, we talk a little bit about the role of brokers or manufacturers reps in establishing the distribution channels and maintaining channel relationships and how important they are for especially small companies um, to get their foot in the door and to establish those relationships. So before I go ahead and introduce our forum speaker today, um, I just want to talk quickly a few housekeeping items. Um, we want this to be an interactive session and we are encouraging questions, please all questions. So please post your questions on the question board there and we'll answer those as we, as we go ahead, okay? Um, okay. So today we're fortunate to have the CEO of one of the largest uh, brokerage firms in the industry. Johnson O'Hare is a broker of more than 3,000 brands. Uh, John Sidnaway is, is the chairman and CEO of Johnson O'Hare. He's been in CPG industry for, for more than 35 years. He started Johnson O'Hare in uh, 1982 after graduating from BU. He has a wealth of knowledge, enthusiasm, passion for the industry. We're so lucky to have him today. And so, John, can you please, uh, you know, follow through and give us a big, uh, brief history of Johnson O'Hare and your progression through the, uh, through the company? And again, welcome. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. I am lucky to be here. Um, a, a former terrier, always a terrier. So great, uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, don't know if uh, many of you had an opportunity to jump on our website, but we're a 64-year-old company, privately held family owned. Um, we've got over 60 shareholders. So, you know, sharing equity and corporate culture is most important to us. Um, representing over 3000 brands across, um, you know, all categories from center store, which is grocery, frozen dairy, fresh food, which can be meat, seafood, deli, baking, over to produce, to confection, to health and beauty, general merch. I mean, if you think about when you walk into a supermarket or a club store or a drug store, all those brands and, and um, um, that are represented in a store, as Remy said, some are sold direct, most are outsourced. And hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but yeah, I started in 1982, um, um, Boston born and raised and, and back in um, the early eighties, obviously before a lot of you were around, um, BU was New York and New Jersey, and we had some healthy rivalries, let's just say, back then. And being from Boston, attending BU, I was a minority. Uh, there were, um, so it was, uh, you know, just a great place to be. What a special culture um, BU was and taught me so much. Um, so, so look, our business is dynamic because if we represent so many brands, each one with their own um, challenges, each one with their own definition of success. What does winning look like? And, you know, our company has just got to be so nimble and flexible and diverse um, as well. Each brand, you know, has a different level of services. So think about what's most important to these brands. And just to give you an idea, some of the brands um, from Chobani to Calafia, which is plant-based. So in dairy, um, organic valley, Cabot cheese in the grocery brands we represent. Some of the largest would be a Keurig, a Bumblebee tuna, Lysol. Think of their challenges with Wreck-It Benkies or in Lysol right now. We also represent Purell. 
Um, and then in the fresh side of our business, we represent Tyson, um, Butterball, Applegate, some brands you'd know in produce, we represent Dole packaged salads, a Del Monte, um, Little Leaf, Little Leaf Farms is one you should write down. When you get a chance, check out their story, it's amazing. They built greenhouses in Fort Devens, Mass. Human hands don't touch the product. <clears throat> Think about how important that is today and in the future. In confection, we represent Tootsie Roll, Werther's, Jack Links, and Peeps. So think about Peeps in Easter, in the Easter holiday, and, and you know that almost not happening. Um, and then in health and beauty, we represent Nature Made Vitamins, and Atkins, and Blistex, and Sun Balm, and Charlotte's Web, and CBD, Zarbies, just so many different brands across the spectrum um, of the consumer packaged goods industry. It, there's never a dull moment. And if you think about representing so many brands, in a way, they, they pay us you know, varying degrees of uh, menu fees. We can talk about that more if you'd like, but we really have 3,000 bosses too. So it's, it's just, it's an amazing industry. A lot of people haven't heard of, you know, brokers, sales and marketing agencies, outsourced SMAs or manufacturers reps. Those are all the different uh, buckets we could get tossed into as to how do you define what we do. So look, that's my, um, that's my opening statement. Remy, um, back to you. Yeah, if you could, um like just describe your role and function as a broker and kind of what are the advantages of using a broker or using JOH uh, for distribution? Um, and also like how might you manage your brokers? So what is a, what is a life in the day of a broker? Yeah, great. I <laughs> appreciate it. Um, there's never a routine day because, you know, again, we're, um, you know, we have so many different clients all with different expectations um, and then you have the customers. So I think, why do people outsource? And, you know, everybody's heard of Procter & Gamble. And back in the day, Procter & Gamble, I mean, there are, there are stories going back that if you worked for P&G and you had any type of sales manual and, and it was open in public, you lost your job. <clears throat> That's how proprietary that company was. So, so to think about them potentially outsourcing you know, just completely remote thought. And now they probably outsource, it's like the 80-20 rule, 20% uh, of the customers, so you think about Costco, Walgreens, CVS, Kroger, you know, the large CPG um, end users, which are retailers that control probably 80% of their volume, they would not outsource. They would put their own direct teams against those businesses. They would highly train and they would have Teams that would include obviously sales, marketing, shopper insights, which is, I don't know if you're, if you're all into um, that yet in your courses, but every time you scan an item and you hear the ping at the register, um, customers sell that data. And it's real important for a brand to know what other brands they interact with. And there's a whole, it opens up a whole bunch of analytics. So they have analytic teams, they have financial uh, metrics, they have finance teams. They could have the Costco team alone for Procter & Gamble could have 50 people on it. The team of people from a P&G in Bentonville calling on Walmart might have 50 to 75 people on it. But the point is, then they draw a line and they take those 80% of the customers that probably only do 20% of the volume and they outsource it. And they hire people like us in their very strict contractual agreements um, that define the relationship, what we can and can't do, and then we're managed tightly um, to make sure that we stay within those boundaries. So brands don't simply outsource sales marketing and other functions to a broker less like us and say, you know, figure it out. I mean, we're very tightly managed with um, you know, all the different metrics, again, depending on the brand from, you know, sales, marketing, pricing, where it's positioned on the shelf, how many times a year will it promote, at what level will the discount be, how's that funded, you know, so on and so on. So there's many different pieces to our relationship, depending on the brand. 
Okay. And what about, um, you talked a little bit about like, you know, the data analytics and marketing and other services that you might, um, that you might do for these brands. Do you have like specialists in those areas or do you have your manufacturer's reps kind of be a master of all those trades or how, how do you guys organize that, those functions? That's such a great question. Yes, we do. Um, it's interesting. If you think about the relationship of a brand at the time that the brand approaches the customer. So whether it's Publix, Kroger, you know, I'm just thinking grocery for a minute, um, stop and shop locally here in, in the Northeast. Um, there's a relationship between the salesperson and the buyer. Buyer, category manager, merchandiser, depending on the account, they, they're referred to as different positions. That relationship is, is, more, is usually um, one that's been earned over many years of, you know, here I am, I'd like to sell you Chobani yogurt. Well, if you think about it, Chobani yogurt, doors would fly open. But 15 years ago when Chobani called our company and we, we approached the customer, the retailer, they were, well, I'm pretty sure um, we have Dannon, we have Yo Play, we have, you know, all these brands that we have. What's Chobani? We don't need it. And, you know, that's really how the relationships start and why relationships at that point is very important because we need to be able to look at, and this is what brokers bring, the person sitting across a desk and saying, you need to listen to this story. You need to take the time and understand because there is something here. So that's one piece of why outsourcing um, works so well for some of these brands is because they don't have the relationships at the point of making the sales call. Now the team of analysts um, that, that sit behind us and do all this work is, okay, help me understand more. You've got Dan and you've got Yo Play. Well, how's the category growing? How are those brands performing within that section? And they study all that data. And they might say, okay, so you've got Dan and you've got Yo Play, you've got private label. And you're right, but look, 20% of their SKUs perform real well, but then you've got some that perform average. How many vanilla yogurts do you need? So look, there is room for a Chobani. So, I mean, that's just the very fundamental way which the analysts um, plug in, but we buy lots and lots of data from IRI, Nielsen, Kantar, um, Coresight, uh, demographic data. It's, our, it's incumbent upon us, one of the, the values we offer back to our brands is the amount of data so we can help them understand what the successful path to that customer is. So how do you avoid conflict between your brands? So you might represent, let's say, two brands in the same category. Um, so how do you avoid conflict? So say I'm a brand new yogurt maker and I want to get in Whole Foods, but you've already got Siggy's. Um, like, how do you how do you manage that? Because it seems like there's almost conflict of interest there. There is. It's it's a great question. We do represent um, many in the same category, and I think I think look. You, so the first thing we do is we look at the category. If it's yogurt, if you stand in front of a yogurt set today, if there aren't 15, 20 manufacturers, there may be more. Um, I think that's one conversation. If you're selling batteries and it's Duracell, you're not going to convince the people from Duracell that it's okay to represent, you know, Energizer. Because if you think about holiday selling season and, and how important those holidays are, and you walk into a store and there are mass pallets of batteries, it's one or the other. It's typically not both. So I think part of the answer to your question is how many players are there in a category? How many tiers of pricing? So we represent Rayo's pasta sauce. And depending on the store, it's six, seven, eight bucks for a bottle of um, pasta sauce. We also represent, you know, um, red gold tomatoes, which is 99 cents. So I, I, think, it's, I think it depends on the category, depends on the amount of um, brands in a category and then how they would interact and then Remy um, compete or not really compete. Consumer segmentation, is a consumer going in, you know, for, for one yogurt, really going to buy another? How do the brands interact? And I think we can sell a story there. 
Okay. Okay. Um, please feel free to give us some questions in the Q&A section there at the bottom of your bar. Um, I've got one last question before I open it up to the, to the students and, and other people that are in on this. I was just wondering how, like, you know, in these challenging times, like how the demands of both your, your client brands and the demands of the retailers changed and how have you been able to, you kind of, because I, I see those as almost conflicting as well. Um, how have you been able to manage that? Very, very conflicting. Um, but I think in, in these extraordinary times, um, everybody is just completely level set from the minute, um, you know, the pandemic hit and expectations change. So the day in the life of what we do is, excuse me, um, where are we? I don't even know. Is it March, April? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. So April, customer A could say, look, we're going to review the dairy category this month. So I want to line up all these appointments with all my dairy vendors, and I want to know what your plans are for new items for the next 12 months. What's the innovation? You know, how are you going to add value to my sections? And um, I mean, there's just so many different um, criteria that when you walk in to meet with a buyer, um, you know, how they want the planning sessions to go. And people spend thousands of hours preparing and, you know, brand teams, shopper insight teams, analytics teams, and the customers themselves spend a lot of time preparing. And there's quite a process, evaluation process of what's my store going to look like six months or a year from now? How am I going to get everybody on this call here excited about walking down to my dairy section? So cascade that over 75,000 square foot store in all of those departments. <clears throat> in one day, everything got shut down meetings got canceled and it was full speed ahead. How are you going to get me products to my stores? And it's evolved into, let's keep yogurt as a, as an example, it's evolved into, Hey, Chobani, I appreciate you selling me 35 items. Um, I only need the top 10 right now. So they're shutting down production lines, not, not specific to Chobani, just in general, but using them as an example. A lot of our clients are only manufacturing the top sellers just so they can stay in stock. A lot of our customers, if you think about their warehouse and distribution, somebody gets sick in the warehouse, the next day um, they may shut down to sanitize. The next day they open up, three quarters of the people aren't gonna show up for work because they're scared. So a lot of our customers have said, look, um, Tomato sauce is an example. If I've got 150 SKUs items, a variety in that store, I'm only gonna ship the top 20, 30. I just can't afford the warehouse pickers to go pick all these obscure items. So it has really turned our industry upside down with the responsibility of just get product to the stores. And what's really interesting is because we're regional. So we were born in Boston, but now we have offices all the way out to Grand Rapids and in Minneapolis. So we're doing twice a week calls with all our teams. And when you talk to them, look, Boston may, Boston, you walk into a store and the store could look pretty good. New York's completely blown out. Um, you know, the Carolinas look good because it really hasn't um, escalated down there yet. But as soon as someone gets sick and someone on the media says, hey, emergency rooms are filling up, the world's coming to an end, everybody goes in the store, good luck finding toilet paper. I mean, it's, it's really been interesting to watch this evolve, but our role today and our clients' roles is just get product on the shelf right now. Okay, uh, we actually have a question from, um, from someone sitting in. Uh, that is related to this, so I'll bring this in right now. I think it has a lot to do with forecasting and the difficulty in forecasting right now. Um, so there's been a lot of press recently about farmers and dairy companies dumping their products due to lack of demand from restaurants, hotels, et cetera. Um, do you think this will have a long-term impact on supply chain post COVID-19? Oh my, my goodness, where everybody's learning so much each day. And, and um, I think, people are scrambling right now to make sure nothing's being thrown away. And um, I know we have some uh, farms that we do business with and 
and and to, it's a great question. And um, while supply currently may be down on, let's say, asparagus, those farmers are already thinking about planting more potatoes instead of asparagus. So I think people, farmers are nimble enough to, you know, to pivot like that. Uh, dairy farmers, I mean, a cow can only produce milk. So um, it's a great question. I don't know exactly. I think milk overall is a category has been suffering recently with all the plant-based, you know, milks that you can buy. And, you know, they've, they've had some other issues. Um, great question. I can't speak to dairy specifically because we're not that big into milk, but if, if food banks who are getting hit up, it's really sad what's happening right now. If they can figure out a way to get packaging to these farmers <clears throat> to get milk in any form, even if it's not single serve, they're, they're working on it right now. I know Feeding America is actively working on that right now to, to, um, for dairy specifically, for milk specifically. But you know, you take a look at meat and meat supply. I think it came out yesterday that um, uh, Smithfield had to close the plant. I think Tyson had to close the plant. Um, so, so I think, yeah, the whole supply chain is gonna be interrupted um, and people are gonna need to uh, get creative. So, so we don't throw anything away. I think in line with that, we have another question, um, another good question. So online grocery and delivery is already kind of predicted to grow and the current situation may have a lasting habit for consumers. Um, how does this type of channel, kind of the grocery delivery channel, is that gonna impact Johnson O'Hare and the brands you represent? Yeah, great question. Um, look, Amazon's, nobody expected this type of demand. Amazon's struggling a little bit and, and um, as I think is everybody getting up to speed so fast. Our, so we have, a, um, we have a team that does Amazon. So we kind of got ahead of the Amazon phenomenon about five years ago. Um, and, and we offer our clients an opportunity to be their agency at Amazon as well as is at, at Walmart. As you know, Walmart acquired Jet. And um, our customers can't move fast enough to get to where click and collect, um, click and pick up, depending on the customer, they call it something a little differently. Um, so we represent a lot of brands with Aho Deles. Aho Deles own Peapod. Peapod Digital Labs out of Chicago was their um, you know, backend platform for their whole click and collect solution. They just brought that all in-house to each one of their brick and mortar banners. So now when we go meet with the stop and shop merchandiser for coffee, rather than say, this is how we want it positioned on the shelf, pricing, positioning, promotion, and all the KPIs, we're also talking about online and e-commerce with them. So I think brick and mortar has woken up to the fact too that this is not going away. It's going to continue to grow and they need to be there. And I truly believe that the way the supermarkets have performed the last two months and for the next foreseeable future, they're, they're, they're heroes again to their local communities. Now, are people gonna to wanna to be waiting in line to go to supermarkets? No, but um, they're winning back some very loyal customers um, and they can do click and collect and you know, it's real important for them to get there as fast as they can. This is a related question from Jeremy. I mean, do you think that given the impact of COVID and social distancing, um, that there's going to be some kind of in-store innovation uh, that will help draw consumers back and make us feel more comfortable when this is all over? Well, right now, the innovation is the plexiglass at the cashiers. Um, it's, it's, you know, you can't bring your own bags in anymore. It's the distancing, waiting in line. It's one-way aisles when you shop. It's... Um, senior hours, it's, um, you know, I think that's as, about as far as they've brought it today. I think click and collect is gonna be a big deal um, where you can, you know, the, the better they get and the quicker they get up to the speed on that. But um, look, these people are, are really smart and they're really good at um, copying. Um, it's not rocket science selling groceries. And you know, some, some people do it exceptionally well and, and others follow. But 
I think right now I would say they were in the scrambling stage to get product to their shelves, all hands on deck. And think about these buildings that hold two, three, four, five hundred 500 people. They're all working from home. Um, so, so for now, I would say um, innovation, it's evolving daily, what the stores look like. It's probably mostly operational innovation, um, but there are some really good minds you know, thinking down the road. And if you have any more thoughts on that, I'd love to hear what you're thinking, you know, cause um, we've got great relationships with our customers. And if anybody on this call has uh, some thoughts on what supermarkets or drugstores uh, might, might think about that, that'd be awesome. I'd love that. I'd love to hear more. In keeping with relationships, um, do your brand companies have any relationship with the retail customer? or is a relationship only through you? So do the manufacturers have any relationships or is it only through JOH? And how do small brands ensure that their brand shows up where they want it and how they want it to be? What a great question. We want our clients to have relationships with the customers. So at some point, look, if you think about walking in with 3000 brands, how much are we gonna know about the brand? I mean, if you are a potential client, I would say we're gonna know as much as you need us to know, but at some point it can be difficult. So we want the brands with us on, on the appointments and we want there be to, to be a connection. And I think more important today than ever, um, having that connection with um, the client, with the brand to the decision makers is real important. And especially if you're a small brand, because if you're a small brand, think of the risk for the, customer, meaning the store. So if a store puts an item on the shelf and the item doesn't perform, or, you know, the item makes someone sick, or, you know, all the things that can go wrong with a brand, having that relationship is really important. Um, so one thing we vet very uh, carefully when, before we onboard a new client or a new brand, we vet the people, we vet how they're supported, how they're backed, because um, at the end of the day, that's our reputation. We have a 60 plus year reputation that we've got to protect. So you think about that as a little brand. If you hire a JOH or one of our competitors, you get to walk in with almost instant credibility, um, which is a big deal. So, you know, kind of a, a whole nother story about what it takes to get a brand on the shelf. Um, but, um, you know, be happy to follow back up on that. And, um, you know, it's difficult. It's, it's shelf space. Shelf space is really difficult. It's got to have a great selling story. Right. We'll get back to the, some more COVID questions, but I kind of want to get to a couple of these other questions. We've got a couple of questions on um, basically like socially responsible brands. So we got two. I'm going to uh, ask this first one. So first, can you speak to the ease or your strategy of selling brands that are socially responsible to those that are not? Um, and so do you think that the pandemic will change on that? And then also, um, uh, Tim says that he read your, your white paper on sustainable products and how retailers are still missing opportunities to educate consumers on products. Um, do you think that that has changed or they've minimized this leakage? Um, yeah, great question. Look, I think at the end of the day, it, it really depends on the customer. If it's a, if it's a Whole Foods, um, but they've changed so much since Amazon acquired them. There are some, put it this, there are some retailers out there that, that want to think they're more socially aware than others in, in sustainability and sustainability and just better for you and healthy. And, you know, look, they, they pound their chest and it's so important to them. It re, and it really truly is. And then there are others that say that, but then when you go in, it's like, look, here are my metrics. Here's my hurdle rate. Success to us means you need to generate X amount of dollars a store a week or turns or margin or, 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 and if not, you know, sorry, you're out. And again, depending on the customer, meaning the retailer, um, you get six months or you get a year, but they have very definite metrics 
Uh, so I think sustainability and, you know, in, in the social messaging to your brand is, is critical, but it's almost so much more important to the consumer, to the person walking into the store and picking it up. The messaging needs to be more to them um, because if it doesn't hit a hurdle rate, no matter how, how you know, how good you are for, for the environment or better for you product, it's not going to stay on the shelf. Competition is so fierce for that space. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, and I've always, you know, I, I agree with that. And I, I do work in this area and I always think that there has to be a business case for it. So you, there has to be both you know, kind of a sustainable development case and a business case. And if you can nail both of those, you're going to be extremely successful. I don't think that COVID or anything changes that. It's just really, um, you know, you have to pull in and have consumers really demanding that for that product. So um, I thought that was a good answer. Um, so here's a couple of questions. So kind of related to forecasting and data analytics. Um, what categories do you see the most growth and competition over, over, I guess, this next year? And do you anticipate any new trends post pandemic? Um, and then a follow up question to that is kind of how do you think like post pandemic is going to affect like mergers and acquisitions, divesture and carve out trends in the whole consumer packaged good industry? Yeah, let me start with that one first. Um, we represent Charlotte's Web. I don't know if you caught that when I was going kind of quickly in the whole CBD space. Um, we represent Charlotte's Web. We represent Mediterra and Mary's. And look, I think a year ago or a year and a half ago, there were thousands of companies in this space attempting to get branding and, and you know, and kind of get out there. Um, what's happening with COVID and, and you know, in legislature with the, with, um, in the CBD space, and getting to retail with, with ingestibles, depending on the state. I think people thought that was going to happen a lot quicker. And a lot of those companies are starting to go out of business and or sell. I think the same thing's going to happen to other segments, you know, and, and mostly um, small startups. The, there's a conference called Expo West. I'm not sure who runs it, but if you, if you click on online Expo West and it's uh, held out in Anaheim. And I want to say on a typical trade show or a conference that our industry goes to, it could be in one building and maybe have a thousand booths, 500 booths. This one had 12,000 booths. And again, I go back to the Chobanis of the world and the Calafia and, you know, um, all those amazing brands in Siggy's, as you said, that had to start somewhere. That's where they all got their start. Um, that got canceled. That was a couple months ago and, and they shut the whole thing down. And, and it was really sad because a lot of people had already flown out to Anaheim. They had shipped their booths out. They had shipped their, um, you know, their samples out and all their, uh, and all their people. And there were a lot of stories that some of those people are going out of business. So this has, it's had such a ripple effect in, in emerging innovation, people want innovation. And if you think about a conference like Expo West in our industry, so we would send normally two or three people to a conference. Our company would send 20 to that. CVS, the drug chain, um, they might send two or three to Expo West, which is really a food show. I think they were sending 15. Costco would send 20. Walmart, 30 or 40 people, and they would all disperse and go find the next big thing. Um, that show got shut down. So to a brand, that was your opportunity to get in front of all these important, you know, retailers and customers. And to the customers, that was a big opportunity to find innovation. So I think that's, that's every division that we represent products in, whether it's confection, produce, meat, seafood, deli, bakery, dairy, have at least two conferences like this a year where the industry goes and they walk and they meet with and they get to sample, pick up, taste, feel um, new brands. And all those conferences are getting shut down right now, <clears throat> which if you think about it, Remy and everybody, it makes our role that much more important. 
because we as an entity, by definition, we have the relationships and we have the access to the customer. But it's really sad to see. Um, and of course, I forgot your first question. Yeah, so I mean, even at now, I'm just going to stick with that yeah. one. So you're saying how much more important your role is. So how would a new company then approach you in today's environment and say, you know, so here's my, you know, how would a Siggy's of, you know, a couple of years yeah. ago approach you and, and, and want you to work with them? Yeah. And we had four last week, three this week and four next week. So they are reaching out. Um, and, you know, again, in the five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they would say, look, we're going to, we're going to fly to whichever office they were interested in hiring. <clears throat> we're going to meet with you and we're going to meet with, you know, three or four or five of your competitors. Um, there are still competitors out there, but Remy, to your earlier point, one of the first things they do to vet us is in the case of, you know, um, so Calathea plant-based, they would say, hey, do you represent Kite Hill? Do you represent, um, who do you represent in the space? And, and are we gonna play nicely with them? And if not, you're eliminated and we move on to the next sales agent. So I think today more so than ever, there's a lot of vetting that goes on prior to the initial um, meeting. But the industry um, has really risen and it's risen in, prominence mostly because of people like P&G, Unilever, Kraft, Coke, um, Pepsi, um, all the big CPG is now outsourcing. So it's just become much more mainstream and, and we are more mainstream as an industry. So we get vetted all the time. That's why our website's so important and social media on LinkedIn and other things that we do is so important. So we've got a question about pricing. Um, so this person asks, I've noticed product prices in grocery stores have increased. Uh, would you happen to know the reason behind this? Is it because of increased costs? Um, because of COVID measures? Is it because manufacturers are raising price? Um, is it people trying to increase profit margins or is it more kind of to cover higher employee wages or more safety precautions? Yeah, great question. When, when um, just so you know, you can't, you can't wake up and just say, you know, Keurig, um, hey, um, our, our coffee's so good, let's take a price increase. <laughs> it's it just the customers are so sophisticated now. If you as a brand go into a customer with a price increase, they have a form and it's no kidding. I want to say it's a two, three, four page form where you've got to identify and quantify uh, over five or six different from people to ingredients to shipping to fuel surcharges to you've got to basically show them exactly what is causing the increase and then they in turn will say you know we accept or we don't accept I mean it's so so if you're seeing increases in price at retail I would tell you um, uh, it's been vetted it's not arbitrary uh, there's a science behind it. And the last thing people want to do is raise prices at any time because it sends customers online um, and to find cheaper avenues. So um, look, everybody's getting squeezed for margin. Customers are getting squeezed for margin, but they'd rather sell you. Um, they'd rather put more product in your shopping basket than have to take their prices up. I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah. What about, um, so you currently have it's like over 3,000 brands you mentioned. Do you think that you'll have like more or fewer of those, you know, this time next year? Wow, ideally, um, you know, you have more. Um, but I would say, look, we protect our culture. Um, it's so important. We want people at our company so happy. Think about um, what's going on these days. We have 175 people that then follow our brands into the stores and we call it merchandising. So in that perfect example where Keurig coffee, you know, you'd have Keurig, you'd have Starbucks, Folgers, Keurig, and, and it is such a science where items are placed. 
Um, customers have schematics and people follow the schematics. They do or they don't. One of the things we do is we go into the stores and make sure they are. And that, that's, that's probably another hour, Remy, somewhere down the road with some of the services we provide. But we sent a letter out um, the day this thing started getting really scary before uh, shelter in place or stay at home, any of that had come out. We said, dear retail merchandisers, um, do not go into the stores if you don't feel comfortable. We're going to do our best to get you gloves and masks and we're going to pay you. So don't, don't worry about anything. We got your back. And um, as you can imagine, uh, the notes that we got back were incredible from our team. Um, we've since got gloves and masks for all of our people. And we've still said, we're sending you these, but if you're not comfortable, do not go in the stores. So culture is something that's real important to our company. And, um, and we've had clients in the past that we kind of heard about, but you know, it's kind of like a, a sports team takes a renegade athlete and they're like, well, you know, if they play for us, they're, they're going to fall right into our culture. Well, it doesn't necessarily happen. We've taken on new clients and quickly told them they need to go somewhere else and terminated our relationship. We, so, so look, we're very careful who we represent. It's got to fit. Um, there's a heck of a criteria that goes along with who we represent. Um, and we're really cautious. I hope we have more brands, but they have to be the right brands. Right. We have another question here about uh, CPG industry in general. And, and, you know, how do you think the CPG industry will change after COVID? And what have you already learned in this, I guess, six weeks, two months um, that will determine what you're going to do in the future? So we, we figured we, thank you so much for that question. We figured we'd give our teams a few weeks to, um, it's been interesting, the timeline, um, the first three weeks, the days were long and it was just incredible. And then last week things started to slow down a bit, meaning um, the new normal was you could see the light at the end of the tunnel. So here's how it's changed. All our customers are now working at home. So everybody's on video. So we're all working from home. We do go in a few days a week, but if we have 125 in our office near Boston, we might only have eight or 10 people in there. We've got everybody working remote and doing great. But, but if um, those review meetings I was talking about is we come in with our client and sit in front of the customer and have a conversation, we think when people go back to work, whatever that's gonna look like, our customers could say, we just want you, if anybody's flying in, tell them not to. We'll bring them in via video. Um, don't ship samples of your new products uh, to our office. You know, you can hand carry them in, but here are the, here are the rules. You know, we're gonna keep distance and, and it's definitely gonna change. I mean, I think a lot's gonna change. How we do business, um, the way we conduct our business, distancing's gonna be real important, uh, food safety, food supply, supply chain, forecasting, planning. You know, our customer's gonna say, I'm gonna open up a, a warehouse and I'm just gonna put toilet paper, Lysol and Purell in there and, and keep it until the next time this happens. I mean, people are thinking all those things right now. And we have clients thinking the same way. So we represent, you know, wreck it Ben Keezer. Think about it, Lysol, they're a global, they're a global CPG. So they're manufacturing Lysol type products in every part of the world right now. I mean, they've got to look at their whole supply chain and instead of having the 15th flavor of Lysol, how many do they need? Lots of changes coming. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, so for, so for brands that are both in store and then sold online, so let's say Amazon and, and Whole Foods, um, for like for a new brand, would they still have slotting allowances for that online uh, portion of it or just for the in-store? Yeah, online has their own set of um, pain points as we lovingly refer to them as, uh, you know, fees and costs. Um, online is really expensive for one of our brands to engage with. You know, you look at the pure online um, providers, whether it's Amazon, there's, there's so many of them. 
And if you're a manufacturer and you're, you're making, um, you know, you've got a small brand, look, you ship pallets or truckloads to the retailer and then they distribute it and put it on their shelves. You know, to ship a piece here or a unit there, or it's just so expensive for them. There's so much more handling involved, um, depending on the size and scale of your brand. Obviously, if you have scale, it's a lot easier, but if you don't have scale, it's expensive. So do you think that all these things will, will continue and the remote working mode will continue even like we have a vaccine and years beyond the pandemic? Not only do I think it will continue, I mean, look, I'm, um, you can tell I graduated BU in 82, so you can, you kind of know where, where my age and demographic and how I was brought up was. I, I think I'm fairly progressive, but let me just say this. If I walk into the office and usually, you know, we could have between 100, 150 people in our office um, up here. Some of our other offices are smaller. And if there's 15 or 20 people in, like, what's it? What's everybody at the beach? Where is everybody? Right. I think when I when I walk in the next time and I look around, I'm going to smile and say, "We got people busting their butts, and no one's here." So I I truly believe. You know, not for you all on the computer right now, because you're, you know, you're, we're so different um, in our approach and how we do business. This is brand new to me. Boy, is it going to be so much more accepted by me. Um, and we are right now ordering, I don't know, 40 or 50 new laptops to make sure we arm our people with the best tools they can have, um, you know, to continue to work this way. I think it'll be more, more than norm is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, so this is really going to cause a fundamental shift in how yeah. everything moving forward. And yeah, I think so as well. And acceptable. Whereas it might not have been as acceptable. It absolutely is acceptable now. Okay. We're going to wrap up here. And if you are any other questions before we move on, let John give us his, 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 uh, his closing thoughts. Um, I encourage you all to, to reach out to me and to reach out to, uh, to John moving forward. If you have any other questions that you, you know, come to mind, you know, like tomorrow or next week or whatever. Um, but it's been like, it's been great having John and having someone with, you know, with such expertise in, in consumer packaged goods and in the area of, of manufacturers, reps and brokers. Um, I think it's going to be something that's going to be even more important moving forward is the role of these people in, 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 in making relationships and, and especially for, for new brands and kind of, you know, kind of being your voice out there. And so I think that it's, it's super important um, for us to understand how they function and also a great way to, you know, to learn the business is to like, like to work in this industry. And so um, please think about that as you go through. Um, I've got one more. Um, so what's the future of food, food service companies if working from home becomes the norm? Yeah, we're not into food service. Um, boy, oh boy. I read an article last week in the New York Times, Christides, uh, and the CEO was um, interviewed. And what I didn't realize was 60% of the food dollar in Manhattan is restaurants and just think about it it's shut down <clears throat> so we've always been retail thank goodness um but i think food service is going to come back it's it's just going to take some time um we have a lot of competitors that are in food service it's a big part of their business and and you know working from home food service is pretty difficult because if you're selling using tomatoes as an example you're then going to pizza shops and sub shops and selling tomatoes. And, um, you know, you've got to be out there uh, working the streets to get your brand in those stores. So that's going to be difficult. Challenges for everybody. This isn't good for anybody. We want this all to uh, come back to the new normal as quickly as we can. Um, again, we're retail CPG and, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, 15 years ago, you might not remember, but Walmart decided they were going to even start selling groceries. And um, everybody was going out of business because Walmart's going to start selling groceries. All the supermarket chains were going to close. 
because Walmart was going to start selling groceries. So here comes Amazon and the whole world's going to change. Everybody's going to go out of business because here's Amazon. No one's going out of business. Everyone's going to have to get better. And that's what happens. I mean, it's changed. The, the question earlier on innovation, someone, someone somewhere is going to figure something out and it's going to make everyone, everyone better. It's just the way the world works. And look, when I, when I graduated BU, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Sorry, Remy, if I shouldn't, I shouldn't, if I shouldn't have said that, That's all right. but, but um, I kind of fell into this and I meet people all the time and they say, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm in a, I just say I'm in the CPG industry. Cause if you say sales and marketing agency, broker, manufacturer's representative, people don't quite get it. Look, our company did almost $4 billion last year in sales. This industry is for real. Um, if you want to learn more, I would love to find some time and I've got some time um, these days, but to chat with you more about it, it's a great industry. And, and when you think about it, consumer packaged goods, 3000 brands. If you've got interest in the brands we represent, you know, maybe someday going to work for one of these manufacturers or, or brands, um, we're family to them. You know, we're partners, we're part of their team. So we're pretty well connected with a lot of people. And I'd be happy to, um, and David and I had spoken about this before, you know, I'd be happy to help you network, facilitate, answer questions, anything you need. So. Great. You have a personal note here from, from Lucy. I'm not sure that you see it or not. So I'll read it to you. Um, thank you so much for presenting. It's been very enlightening. And on a personal note, your brothers, Mark and Tom are my heroes. Uh, <laughs> I've been a 20 year customer of Pemberton. And we continue to be impressed with how well you and your family are handling this. Oh, isn't that nice. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you is a big word, especially these days to all of you. So appreciate that. All right. So we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for, for taking the time today to, to join us. Uh, hopefully we'll do a bunch more of these as we go through. I think it's a way that we can kind of try to connect more and try to try to give you guys um, you know, some more kind of experiential learning without being face to face. Uh, I hope everyone is, is, is keeping well and healthy. Uh, I'm missing you guys and uh, we'll talk to you soon. John, do you want to say some goodbyes? You're muted. Uh, rats. I was really working on that. <laughs> no, thanks for the invite. Go be you. Thanks for all you guys are doing. Stay strong. All right. Thanks so much guys. Stay well.